We're at the Latin Naval History Unit at uh, the Department of War Studies, and we are actually functioning as part of the Central Health Center for the History of War. So, those three are your hosts for this evening, as was King's College. So, the four hosts for this evening, this is another of the British Commission for Maritime History, King's Maritime History Seminars, organized by the BCNH and with the Society for Nautical Research and with the help of Lloyd's Register. I think it's knowing that all of that institutional backing uh, behind you. I am very pleased uh, to uh, introduce tonight's uh, speaker, is Maisa Edwards, who is doing a PhD um, jointly at uh, the University of Sao Paulo, Brazil, uh, and here. Uh, and uh, she's an expert on uh, Brazil, Brazil defense uh, policy and, uh, and, and diplomacy in the South Atlantic. And um, in, in addition to an academic career, she has an experience in multinational corporations and things, which uh, we always like to point out, or I always like to point out, um, uh, I think academic expertise is not the only expertise that helps to inform uh, some of the view of the world. But it is about uh, the subject of the PhD that we're talking about tonight, which is Brazil um, and the evolution of uh, Brazilian defense relations in the South Atlantic. And so it is with genuine uh, gratitude that uh, I welcome you to the seminar and hand over to you uh, to speak. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, good evening, everybody, both in person and online. I hope you can all see me. Um, as uh, was said, my name is Maya Edwards. I'm a final year joint uh, international relations PhD candidate at the University of Sao and King's College London. I'm in my final year, which is very exciting. So I'll be submitting this year after uh, all the challenges that came with doing a PhD during the pandemic. But uh, it's been wonderful. I really enjoyed my research. I hope that I gave you guys uh, a good insight as to my research and all the wonderful things that are to be learned about Brazil and the South Atlantic. So without further ado, yes, um, my research is on Brazil and the Zopacus. Now, the Zopacus is an acronym, as I'm sure you gathered. It stands for the Zone of Peace and Cooperation of the South Atlantic. And my uh, focus of my research is providing an analysis of the evolution of Brazilian diplomatic and defense relations in the South Atlantic from a period of 1986 to 2013. Uh, my thesis does also provide present and future considerations, but the main kind of portion of my research is within that um, 27 year time frame. So, um, with regard to my presentation. Um, I have a structure here to help guide us on this adventure. Um, I'll firstly go through an overview of the key points on the Zopacus, um, some sort of key takeaways I feel everybody should know before I start getting more technical with my research. And then I'll move on to my thesis concept and research question, followed by a thesis uh, outline structure, and then a walkthrough of my seven uh, chapters of my thesis and then also provide a little teaser of my action plan for the upcoming months and then of course open up for questions and queries at the end. So in terms of key points with regards to the Zopacus, uh, first of all it was established in 1986 um, by the UN General Assembly. Uh, its founding declaration is ARES 4111 and when it was established at the United Nations General Assembly uh, assembly. I included here the little voting record. Um, 124 countries voted in favour of the resolution, eight abstained and one voted no. Can anyone guess which was the sole country that voted against the, the creation? USA. USA, very good. Very good. The um, USA was the only country that voted against the establishment of the Zopacus. The UK voted in favour, the USSR voted in favour, but alas, the USA did not vote in favour of creating this zone of peace. Um, when the uh, declaration came about, um, it has seven preambulatory and seven operative clauses, predominantly focusing on um, the maintenance of the South Atlantic as a zone of peace and cooperation. It also has as a focus 
um, the removal of the effects of a Cold War, such as the threat posed by nuclear weapons, and also the possible militarization of the South Atlantic. And in terms of um, some other clause that potentially people don't expect when you're thinking about a zone of peace um, in the South Atlantic, it also has certain um, kind of humanitarian clauses. For example, it states unequivocally that it is against the uh, apartheid regime in South Africa. It views it as a threat to the security of the South Atlantic region. So in terms of the critical commitments, um, the key takeaways are that it is a zone that um, aims to be a nuclear weapons free zone. It uh, seeks to maintain peace in the region. It seeks to further cooperation between the member states of which when the Zopakis was established, there were 22, there is now 24. So when the uh, Zopakis was first established, um, in terms of the current cohort, uh, the two countries that were missing were Namibia and South Africa. As we know, in 1986, South Africa was ruled by the apartheid regime and Namibia was similarly occupied by um, South African forces. So with the um, membership of the Zopakis on establishment, there were 22 member states and currently there are now 24 upon the inclusion of Namibia after the country's independence and South Africa since the end of the apartheid regime, and also the country's um, disbandment of its nuclear weapons um, program. As that is a very important component of being a member of the Zopakis, it is, as I said, a zone that aims to be a nuclear weapons free zone, therefore none of the member states may possess nuclear weapons. In terms of ministerial meetings, there have been seven thus far. The first two years after the inception of the zone of peace in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil in 1988. That was followed by uh, Abuja in 1990. As you can see, the ministerial meetings, they oscillate between being in South America and in Africa. All the member states, I'll show you a little map as well, are located in South America and in Africa. So you can see that there is that switch over. Um, Brasilia in 1994, Brazil hosted once again um, as a part of the ministerial meeting. Somerset West in South Africa in 1996, Buenos Aires in 1998, Luanda 2007, and Montevideo in 2013. So as you can see, the most recent ministerial meeting of the Zopakis occurred quite a little while ago. And that is where my thesis is seeking to ask if now with all the changes, especially the attitudes of the Brazilian Navy towards um, potentially um, revitalizing the zone, if that is something that may happen. So I hope that gives you a little overview of some key points of the Zopakis for you to bear in mind as I walk you through my PhD research. So this is a map. As you can see, um, these are the current 24 member states. You have three in South America, so Brazil, Uruguay, and Argentina, and then 21 um, states in Africa, ranging from Cape Verde down to South Africa. I hope that helps, especially when I start delving into all the fun empirical things that I learned in my research that you can see who are the players in this research. So as to my thesis concept, well, um, to give you some background, um, I kind of got to the idea of researching the South Atlantic from my master's research. Um, I'm very lucky in the audience to have one of my supervisors here, Professor Anthony Ferreira. Thank you for being here. Um, I did my master's here at King's um, in the Brazil Institute, where I still am. And my master's research was on Anglo-Brazilian diplomatic and defense relations during and after the Falklands War. So that was my sort of gateway um, into looking at the South Atlantic and also trying to understand um, what are the other kind of big players, not only in the South Atlantic, but also what are the big players doing and talking about in the South Atlantic? And this is where Brazil, with the highly developed Navy that it has, the region, you know, is a major player. So in terms of developing my ideas, uh, I can confidently say that this fascination that I have with the South Atlantic began far earlier than 2018 when I started my PhD. It very likely, well, certainly began back in 2016 when I started my master's. Um, in terms of my kind of driver, uh, I have... My research question, which steers my research, which looks at how does Brazil use its membership of the Zopakas in its diplomatic and defense relations in the South Atlantic. And this is where 
it's something that I tell my students I teach in um, international development and war studies. I say to them, it's very important when you're choosing your research question to think about how you're going to phrase it. A how question is different from a why question, which is different from a what question. So with my question being, how does Brazil use its membership? That involves looking at not only Brazil's relationship with the Zopacus, but also the way in which it uses the fact that it is a member state in its diplomatic and defense relations in the South Atlantic region. And as we know, there are 24 member states, but there are also very important extra regional actors in the South Atlantic. The US is there, China's there, you know, it's all part of the puzzle as such. So this is the research driver of my research. And this kind of came about because as I began to do my preliminary readings and research into my topic, I realized that as much as there are consensuses about Brazil being a leading member, that it you know, has all sorts of interests in the South Atlantic. When it came to developing my research question, I decided that in terms of looking at this idea of membership and how Brazil uses this membership, there is far more to be explored. And this is something that I truly hope that my research will be able to fill, to not only provide um, an insight as to how Brazil um, acts in the Zopacos, but how it uses its connection to these other countries within the Zopacos framework in its diplomatic and defense relations in the South Atlantic region. So now to my thesis. Um, when it came to developing my thesis structure, this has gone through many twists and turns, as I'm sure your PhD students know in the room and online, it is something of a process. So with my thesis structure, this is um, a structure that I believe showcases the best of what my research is going to be able to offer. So it begins with obviously my introduction and methodological considerations, followed by uh, a theoretical framework, which involves um, dissecting and analyzing um, theories of zones of peace, as well as aspects of securitization theory. And essentially the first chapter focuses around building a conceptual and theoretical framework, which will be used for my analysis as I progress. Chapter two is on Brazil and South Atlantic region. So this is a literature review, a predominantly literature review, examining uh, the literature produced on Brazil and the South Atlantic. I'll speak a little bit more about that particular chapter as well later. But in terms of understanding um, the progression of this thesis, it's important to see these two first chapters as a strong um, introduction, both theoretically and in terms of the literature that's been produced, to follow into my four core um, triangulation and research chapters. So in terms of my first chapter with my introduction, so in terms of introducing this concept, the Zopakis, as I'm sure many of you may think, um, is something that it's, it's not super research. You know, people, when you think of, um, you think, well, an international organization, you think the UN, you think NATO, an institution, you know, there are so many that we could choose from. However, the Zopakis is a zone of peace. And this is where, when it comes to my research, I really try and shine a light on that. And in terms of introducing my work, I make a point, of course, of acknowledging the works that have done, been done before me, including a thesis that came out of King's College London back in 1997 by Jennifer Caviala. She came from War Studies and she um, analyzes the packets. So I'm hoping that now myself, you know, what, 20 years later, picking up um, this fascinating topic. Mm -hmm. And I obviously provide a deep dive of my research question, what it represents, and then go into my methodological um, considerations. And in terms of my methodology, my research, it relies on three empirical data sets, which I'll be dissecting in a moment, but it's qualitative, it's an analysis of um, documents from the Brazilian, known as uh, Brazilian Embassy Archives, so it's like the Brazilian Foreign Ministry Archives, which are called the Tavarachi. So I have three data sets, the first being these telegrams and dispatches from the Brazilian um, Foreign Ministry Archives, also documents from the UN Digital Library Archives, and also the empirical data that I gathered from semi-structured elite interviews that I conducted with senior uh, Brazilian and South African um, former and current diplomatic and defense personnel. And then I include a thesis chapters um, overview, which as you have seen, there are seven chapters. 
So now to the, I find extra fun part. When it came to gathering my research um, and doing gathering my empirical data, um, it, let's just say it went very well, I think overall. However, when you consider pandemics and COVID and having all sorts of issues with collecting data, it wasn't necessarily the most straightforward process. But I think in terms of gathering my research, I was able to do that well. Um, I spent um, six and a half months in Brazil as part of my field work and also as part of my joint PhD commitments at the University of Sao Paulo. So I went to Brasilia, to the Brazilian Foreign Ministry Itamarashi Archives, and um, looked at both the paper and Introdox archives. The Introdox um, archives are those that are from 2000 onwards. The paper archives are in many, many boxes, <laughs> which involves going through the boxes, finding the appropriate information. And I also, through doing this, have been building a key as well to Itamarashi terms and identifying key actors and participants. And this is going to be a bilingual, so Portuguese and English um, terms base as such, which I can have in my research, but also hopefully aid any future scholars that want to delve into the Itamarachi archives. With regard to the UN Digital Library archives, this involved declarations, resolutions, speeches, letters, voting records and reports, and they are focused just as those uh, documents from the Itamarachi archives on Brazil and the Zapatas and the South Atlantic. Um, so in terms of looking at these um, UN Digital Library Archives, it involved um, going through their online database, which thankfully, because of COVID, was still very much accessible, so I was able to find all the information that I needed. Um, I also conducted um, six semi-structured elite interviews with current and former um, diplomatic and defence personnel. In terms of my uh, interviewees, um, they were all, you know, selected incredibly carefully with regard to their roles, um, chiefly, as I said, in Brazilian diplomatic and defense relations, and in the one case, um, South African defense relations. So Antonio Patriota, he is a former Brazilian foreign minister. He's currently ambassador in Egypt, Brazilian ambassador in Egypt, and I interviewed him in person in Rome back in 2019 when he served as ambassador, um, Brazilian ambassador to Italy and San Marino. Um, the Nelson Jobim is a former Brazilian defense minister. So he served also prior to being a defense minister as a justice minister, but I was interested, of course, in his perceptions and views as a defense minister. Gelson Fonseca Jr. and Luis de Sejimora are both former Brazilian permanent representatives to the United Nations. And Robert Higgs is a former South African rear admiral. Um, who, interestingly enough, was also a pallbearer at Nelson Mandela's funeral. Um, Celso Amorim um, has served previously as a Brazilian foreign minister, a defense minister, and a representative to the United Nations. And all six of um, my interviewees were very able to give me wonderful insights, not only on the establishment of the Sopakas, but also its evolution. So essentially, these are the three empirical data sets which I use in my analysis chapters. And the data which I gathered from these data sets is triangulated in the chapters that follow. So in terms of providing um, my theoretical framework, as I mentioned, I'll be using theories of zones of peace, but also aspects of securitization theory. And in terms of dividing up my research, um, I am obviously having a little introduction, followed by um, a deep dive on understanding zones of peace. I'm sure that you've, you know, hopefully heard of like the Treaty of Tataloko, Treaty of Japan and Daba. You know, these are all examples of land zones of peace, but also nuclear weapons free zones. And this is where I argue that the Sopakas is quite unique in that not only is it a maritime zone of peace, but it also um, aims to be and um, works as a nuclear weapons free zone. And in terms of understanding what the Zopakas is, once I have been able now, I think, to dissect and pull out the different strands of understanding zones of peace, I'm able to provide a better understanding framework of what is the Zopakas to progress to doing my traffic. So the aspects of, of securitization theory um, are focused primarily on securitization and diplomacy. 
and also on regional security. So with Zones of Peace, I primarily look at the works of um, Kakovitz and with securitization with Buza to give you a framework. And that's my chapter one. With my chapter two, as I said, this will be a chapter primarily focused on um, the existing literature and is subdivided into looking at Brazil and the South Atlantic, but also Brazilian maritime security priorities, such as its interests in its territorial waters and also the blue Amazon security nexus. There is also an analysis of the Brazilian defense documents, which have been produced since the establishment of the Zopacus in 1986. So, for example, there are there's the Politico de Defesa Nacional from 1996, the um, different Livre um, de Defesa, which are the white books of defense, and also the up and coming new um, Politico Nacional de Defesa on maritime issues, and also the new white book of defense. So, in terms of providing a sort of framework for both literature and theory, these are the two kind of introductory chapters that lead into the triangulation chapters. So in terms of chapter three, this is when the triangulation gets fun. When it comes to providing this um, overview of the establishment of this purpose, um, although it was established in 1986 by the UN General Assembly, it's very important to understand that there are heavy influences from the legacy of the Falklands Malvinas War. And this is where having done the master's research, which I did on Anglo-Brazilian diplomatic and defense relations during and after the war, in understanding this legacy um, of the war in terms of shaping the way in which we view the South Atlantic, these are important tools to see how it formed in terms of the importance for Brazil, but also the future member states to create a zone of peace. You know, when you've had a recent war as they have had, you know, as well as military dictatorships in countries in South America, when it comes to setting up um, a zone of peace, these are all aspects that need to be considered. So when it came into the establishment, establishment process of the Zopacus, I went through all the empirical data which I collected at the Brazilian Foreign Ministry Archives, the UN um, Digital Library Archives, as well as my interviews, and have triangulated and produced um, a, an overview of the establishment process. And this is where I argue strongly that, you know, Brazil was a very important country, not only the establishment of Sopacos, but in the drafting of the resolution itself. Um, I've also seen um, reasons as to why the US, for example, voted against the establishment of Sopacos. Remember, that was the only country that voted against. So I have found documents in the Brazilian Foreign Ministry archives that detail how the US um, refused to accept the omission, for example, of Angola as a security threat. Um, only South Africa is mentioned as a security threat in the declaration of the Zopacus. The Angola isn't. Um, when, as we know, there were, you know, it's a socialist country, you know, it's something that the um, Americans viewed negatively, especially in the Cold War period. So in terms of finding out this establishment process, it has been um, truly fascinating to see how um, different countries also work together to both draft the ultimate ARES 4111 declaration that established the zone of peace, but also learn how Brazil negotiated and spoke to the US, um, also had meetings with the UK, uh, also spoke to Argentina. Argentina was very keen to make sure that the Zapata's declaration you know, was very much kind of steered towards you know, protecting the interests of the countries of the South Atlantic, you know, as much as we all know, you know, the UK has Falklands Malvinas, it has, you know, South Sandwich, South Georgia, it has Ascension Islands, Galina, um, Tristan de Cunha, so it has, as much as the British have a presence in the South Atlantic, the UK is not a member of the Sopacus, and it's obviously a nuclear weapons power as well. So when it comes to understanding the establishment of the Sopacus, I've thus framed um, this chapter in this way, and then I provide a deep dive into the seven uh, preambulatory and seven operative clauses of the Zopacus Declaration. I then move into an analysis of um, the Zopacus and the Cold War. So this period is from 1987 to 1990, and it begins with an evaluation of the first Zopacus ministerial meeting in Rio in 1988 followed by um, an analysis as well of the outcomes of this meeting. Considering this was the first meeting, it's very interesting to see how the uh, clauses of the declaration are put into practice. 
So for Brazil as being the first um, host nation, it was there to really kind of set a precedent as to how the Zupacus might look like. Um, it then followed with Abuja as a second meeting in 1990, and then it looks at the um, outcomes of Abuja. And in terms of planning my subsequent chapters, that kind of set a framework in terms of looking at the meeting itself, the outcomes of the meeting, and in terms of using my documentation, I was able to show the internal Brazilian perspective of the meetings, but also the way in which the UN was had um, the Zapacas reported to it. Because what's interesting with the Zapacas, and one of the reasons why I contend that it is a zone of peace and not obviously an organization or anything like that, is it doesn't have any of that framework. You know, the Zapacas does not have um, a headquarters, it does not have a secretary general, you know, it doesn't have a budget. It is essentially quite an abstract format. And that's something that I grappled with a lot, especially my first and second year of my PhD, until I realized that it was essentially what it was designed to be, a zone of peace. So when it came to doing this mapping, I then move into the post-Cold War period. And as you can see, the frequency of the ministerial meetings increased. Um, we had a second hosting for Brazil, um, in Brasilia in 1994. And this is where the insights of um, Celso Amorim were particularly important as he was chair of this event in Brasilia. So he was able to give lots of really interesting perspectives of what the meeting was like on the ground per se. Um, in terms of Somerset West, um, as you know, that's in South Africa. So this was where things got particularly interesting. And I know I'm using that a lot, but I do truly, really enjoy my research. I think, I hope that is coming up. Um, when it came to the expanding of the uh, Zopakis membership, this is the decade where shifts started to occur. The membership increased from 22 to 24. Um, and South Africa, once it had disbanded its nuclear weapons program, was therefore, and had, you know, the party regime ended when Nelson Mandela was elected. So, the fourth ministerial meeting took place in Somerset West. And this is where similarly, you know, the agenda started developing, it started adjusting because the post-Cold War period without the two hegemons of the US, of the USSR, it was starting to kind of find itself. So the South Atlantic was very much kind of progressing in not only its view by the internal players, but also the extra regional players. Um, then I look at the outcomes of the Sunset West meeting, progressing into uh, the last meeting of the 20th century, so in Buenos Aires in 1998. And this is where with Buenos Aires, considering Argentine interests in the South Atlantic and as well its interests in the Falklands Marvinas, it also gets curious because the way in which Argentina still views its purpose is often as another tool in which it can argue to the UN that it wants its islands back as such. So that is my chapter five. My um, Zobacus in the New Millennium. This is my, um, my last, my fourth and final of my um, triangulation chapters. So as you can see, there is another meeting and this is a planned meeting. And this was an addition that I made following my empirical research because I found evidence in my empirical research. And this is something that I hadn't found in any literature that had been produced that there had been a planned ministerial meeting in Benin, in Cotonou, in 2003. And this is very interesting because when it came to um, the gaps between the meetings, as you can see here, you know, we have two year increments. We then have the beginning of a period of larger gaps. So the 2003 ministerial meeting, had it occurred, would have been at quite an interesting moment in time, not only with the new considerations that would have happened post 9-11, but also the different considerations that would have been made in terms of security priorities. So this is a planned ministerial meeting, which this segment, you know, came out of the research. It's something that I learned from doing my empirical research, that there had been this planned ministerial meeting, but then there were the two meetings that occurred most recently in the 21st century, Luanda in 2007 and Montevideo in 2013. And in terms of Montevideo, I got lucky with both um, my interviewees because the Montevideo 2013 meeting was the first in which representatives from both the foreign ministry and the defense ministry were both required to attend. So two of my interviewees were present in Montevideo 2013. So Celso Mourinho was there in his capacity as defense minister and Antonio Patriota in his capacity um, as foreign minister. 
So this uh, is, I hope, an overview then of my four translation chapters. Um, my final chapter, my chapter seven, is my chapter with my peculiar remarks and as well some insights on the Zapaka's future considerations. I divided this um, closing chapter uh, thematically um, because it will allow me not only to answer my research question of how does Brazil use its membership of Zapaka's, but it also will allow me to provide insights, um, you know, theoretical kind of, I can do theoretical refinement in terms of Zopakis as a zone of peace, but also um, provide new insights on Brazil and Zopakis, the Zopakis ministerial meetings, um, Brazil and its relations with the Zopakis member states, and also Brazilian maritime security considerations. And this section with the maritime security considerations also encompasses Brazil's relations, <coughs> not only with other member states, of course, and how it, you know, you have examples of Brazil's cooperation with Namibia in terms of the Brazilian Navy, um, but also with extra regional actors, you know, and in terms of a central argument in my research is that, you know, as much as Brazil is a leading actor in the Sopacos, it still is interested in furthering its own agenda and furthering its own interests in the South Atlantic. And that involves building these close relations with the Pakistan states, but also with extra regional actors, you know, to work well with the US, work well with the UK, it's all in Brazil's interests. And I kind of close that chapter with questioning, you know, are we seeing at the moment a new revitalization of the Zopakas? And I will cover this in a minute, but in terms of um, this question of a new revitalization, well, there was a planned ministerial meeting as well in 2015 in Cape Verde, which didn't occur. Um, it is, it's still kind of on the cards as such. Um, back in July last year, uh, we had a new resolution on the Sopakas back in, UN, um, in 2020 in September at the UN General Assembly. Our, um, our president, Bolsonaro, he um, spoke about the Sopakas that was mentioned. Um, I didn't like a lot of other things that Bolsonaro said at his UN General Assembly speech. However, when I heard that he mentioned Zopakis, I was quietly delighted. <laughs> uh, I'm not entirely sure who told him about Zopakis. I don't think he knows what the Zopakis maybe is, but I'm sure that his uh, defense advisors do, and especially his naval advisors. So in terms of this idea of a new revitalization and also the new security concerns, of course, you know, there's um, an increase in piracy in the Gulf of Guinea, you know, there's all sorts of other concerns in terms of drug trafficking, overfishing. Um, very recently as well, there was a training exercise between the Brazilian Navy and the Cameroonian Navy. And in terms of um, this idea of a new revitalization, well, Cape Verde is still on the cards. So if Cape Verde were to host an eighth ministerial meeting, that could be within the umbrella of the next couple of years, potentially. You know, because if the Brazilian Navy continues at the rate that it is in terms of taking active interest in the Zopakas, well, it's possible. So in terms of my breakdown, um, that is what my thesis is looking like. Um, in terms of an action plan for the upcoming months, um, I'll be submitting um, this summer. So if all goes to plan, I'll be submitting August, September this year. Uh, Fiverr, who knows, maybe November. And at the moment, I'm in the stage of thinking about possible applications for lectureships, uh, postdocs, or consulting roles. And uh, that's all I have to say for now. Um, so thank you so much. And um, also, if you want to learn more about the Zopakas, I have two published works, one in tandem with my supervisor, um, Dr. Inicius Maria Carvalho, which is on uh, Brazil between Zopakas and NATO. This was written um, back in 2020 not long after the whole Trump saying, Brazil could be a NATO member. We're like, no, NATO ally. Woo. So that kind of looks at, at, uh, at that. And then also a published work of my own on this idea of the sort of purpose of return to prominence for ideology theory practice. So here's my email and uh, yeah, thank you very much. this sort of thing but hopefully we can we'll want that um find out uh, a little bit uh, more now if we could so if there are any questions i'll see if there are some in the chat and we will and we will um
also entertain some from um, uh, from outside, as it were. But uh, there's one here. Yeah. Well, yeah. Thank you. Um, I wonder if you could expand on the foundation, and particularly, I'm particularly interested to know to what extent it might have been brought about on account of it, the Falklands War. Mm -hmm. Was that it, sort of a motive, a particular motivation for? So for, for the players or not? Yeah. Is there a follow-up? Well, I, you know, I wonder if you could... What, amongst all of them? Yeah, of course. So in terms of the legacy of the Falklands War, um, one of the things that I have found, especially in the Malachi, the Brazilian Prime Minister archives, is that there was quite a strong level of concern, especially um, on the part of Brazil, for when the British started building the uh, base at Mount Pleasant in the Falklands, mm -hmm. and also when the Chileans, still obviously under dictatorship, started building their um, planned air base in Easter Island, which the US would have access to. So that was seen as a concern because we'd have these extra regional actors potentially coming in and risking heightening the militarization of the. Oh, sorry, Ch Chile and Easter Island. Yeah. So around 85, 86, so just prior to the establishment of purpose, um, the British were based as we, you know, we have the Falkland Islands, but they were starting to increase the construction for an airbase yeah. in Mount Pleasant. And that was viewed with a lot of concern by both Brazil and Argentina, Argentina for obvious reasons. But for Brazil, it was seen as steps by, you know, another power to essentially militarize the region. Yeah. Um, I included the aspect with the base on Easter Island and Chile, because it was again a concern for this idea that both sides of South America might face militarization on both sides. So, in terms of the uh, impact of the Falklands Malvinas War, I think it was definitely um, an important moment. And it said, even in interviews that in the interviews I conducted, that it was viewed as a watershed moment, not only to change the way in which the South Atlantic was perceived in the region, but also by other uh, other players, because you know the South. South Atlantic, unlike the North, you know, the North is the province of NATO, it's the province of the US, it's the province of the UK. Whereas the South Atlantic has multiple players, you know, you don't just have Brazil that has development, you also have South Africa, Nigeria started to grow its name, Angola. So in terms of the legacy of the war and shaping the ideas behind the establishment of the I think it was definitely there, and it's something that I argue in my thesis. But there was also this aspect of wanting to have um, greater regional cooperation. And this is where Harold has fantastic uh, work as well in terms of what he proposed as a SATO, like a South Atlantic Treaty Organization, which would include South Africa. However, again, in my empirical research, I realized and learned that that was something that was not going to be acceptable to Brazil nor to Argentina. Because when it came to developing this idea of a zone of peace, having a country that had a rule that they didn't agree with, especially considering you know, Brazil, Argentina, and Uruguay had just left behind years of military dictatorship, you know, including South Africa was a bit ago. So I hope that answers your question. So, so, so the South Atlantic was, a, you know, apart from the Europeans just fighting down there, they didn't really peaceful part of the world's oceans. Might be one, one factor. Change, you know, Absolutely, and considering you know, when you think of 100 years prior, you know, 150 years prior, you obviously had the slave trade, you had all sorts of kind of active um, movement in the South Atlantic. But you know, it's absolutely true that the Falklands will change the perception. It was only in 1982, and also in the documents that I found in the UN, you know, in 1982, I believe it was in November, November reserves, they started projecting this idea of having. Um, an international year of peace, and that was going to be 1986, which can't be a coincidence that the Soviet peace was established in 1986. So it's all part of a large initiative to have a moment of peace, especially considering that Cold War was starting to thaw and the environment was starting to become a bit more uh, friendly. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay, we've got one, one from. Um... Uh, online, but let, let's take one more from the room and then we'll go online and then we'll go to, to you. So we'll start here. Um, so, Lizzie, you mentioned the Belt Treaty. 
Um, <clears throat> so I was wondering, some of the African countries, not, not sure well, that also belong to the African Nuclear Weapons Reason, uh, Brazil, and Latin America. So bilateral agreement that they started. Um, so I was wondering how the, if there's some sort of uh, cooperation on nuclear weapons, meaning um, like they advocate for this framework for disarmament, for instance, or if there's some sort of a policy or they leave it for other groupings. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so what's the, the relationship between them? There's, you said that there's no institutional framework, no budget. So I'm assuming, of course, they don't have, um, um, yeah, but they don't have a sort of an autonomous oversight, for instance, as we talked about the treaty established between Argentina and Brazil. Uh, so how does the, the, the nuclear dimension feature in these two countries? Yeah, absolutely. This is where, you know, as I said, in terms of to be a member of the zone of peace, you can't possess nuclear weapons. And you also, in the case of South Africa, they disbanded their nuclear weapons program. Um, Brazil, as we know, is still is in the process of having um, nuclear submarines. They're not going to be used for any sort of military purposes, um, as far as I have seen or read. So in terms of nuclear um, understanding technology, I think as long as long as it remains in peaceful kind of peaceful use, as as you mentioned, the agreement between Brazil and Argentina, it's still a factor that is very much it's because FACS aims to be a nuclear weapons free zone. Um, in terms of legally, well, if let's say the UK or the US went through the South Atlantic with you know nuclear warheads, it becomes a bit difficult because you obviously have the law of the high seas, you have all sorts of other um, things to factor in uh, beyond when you get through past territorial waters, the EEC, et cetera. But in terms of the nuclear aspect, that's something that I look at in terms of nuclear weapons free zones and looking at understanding how this practice functions. So yes, all the member states are, are non-nuclear weapon states, but in terms of adapting to threats, the perceived threats from nuclear powers, such as the US and the UK, um, that's when it becomes tricky because you have the law of the high seas. So if you're going through the kind of central corridor, and especially if British are going to Falkland Islands to, you know, train their bases in in Ascension, it, it becomes a bit more difficult, especially to legally impose something. And unfortunately, this is where you know the big powers will still talk louder, right? I hope that answers the question. Let's let's involve our <laughs> online uh, crowd. And there's a question there. I don't know. You might might. Uh, Prefer to read it your, yourself, yeah, um, but it's about ex, you know the maritime security collaboration and other aspects. Oh, awesome! Of, of it. Okay, so um, Roger is asking a question on maritime security collaboration with extra regional powers, and I mentioned quite rightly um, piracy, unregulated fishing, search and rescue training, capacity building. What's the nature? What states involved? So it's very interesting that he, I'm being asked this question because in at the end of March, there's going to be the International Studies Association Conference in Nashville. I'm unfortunately not going to go, but I am collaborating with a researcher called Camila Braga, who's a PhD at USP, and she and I are writing an article together about this exact uh, topic, um, looking at extra regional actors in the South Atlantic. So if it's okay, can you ask me in a couple of months if that's all right? Because I'm still in the process of, of putting together and writing this um, this, um, this article. And in terms of my own research, yes, there is that aspect of looking at extra-regional actors, the US um, and China, but that is still very much in terms of the current and future considerations. And as I'm very much deep in the writing up phase of my historical chapters, I think I, at the moment, I just have those a bit fresher in my mind. Mm -hmm. So forgive me for that. All right, we'll, we can go on to that. We'll follow you with that question uh, <laughs> later. In the meantime, we're going to go back. Okay, so, well, uh, well, thank you again for the time. It's lovely to, to, to speak. Uh, I have one question that um, about uh, like the security, the security problem of the South Atlantic. Um, could, do you think, uh, in, in which way do you think the extended peace is actually effective to has been effective to address you know, security problems within the South Atlantic. Yeah. I ask that because, uh, as you mentioned, there's uh, you no know, institutional framework, there's no budget, and so on and so forth. And at the same time, uh, it, it, it seems to me that when so package was created, it was uh, sort of like a, a collective reaction to great power interference in the area to say, okay, this is an area that we are not like, going to accept great powers to act. However, uh, what are the material capabilities and interests of you know, the member states to actually increase the security of the country? 
tackle the security issues. Yeah, so in terms of your question, uh, which is, I guess, my like two questions. Yes, yeah, sorry. Uh, so, okay. Um, in terms of how it works, um, well, you look at other examples of cooperation between countries. So, you have Atlas Sur, for example, you've got Brazil, you've got South Africa, you've also got all sorts of other um, you know, naval exercises like IPSA with India as well. So, there are many other ways as well, which Brazil, and especially the Brazilian Navy, works with other member states. But in terms of within the framework of the Pacific itself, Brazil, you know, is very invested in having its other member states on board. You know, you look at, you only need to look at the Montevideo meeting and see how much Brazil was invested in getting African representatives over by, you know, essentially bringing them over, or sending Brazilian planes to bring them over to have them participate in Montevideo. So in terms of addressing the security concerns, well, when it comes to looking at the Pacific practice, it's essentially a method in which the countries not only can cooperate to protect themselves, but also to further their own initiatives and their own projects. You know, in terms of Brazil, Brazilian Navy training with the Namibian Navy, that is a method of, co of cooperation. And especially, you know, we have our own articles that we're writing for our project. But when it comes to looking at these current and future considerations, I'm sure there's going to be more coming up with Brazil's interest in protecting its interests, not only its Blue Amazon security nexus, but also in increasing cooperation with Nigeria and in the Gulf of Guinea. I'm, I'm sure I've missed some things in my in my terror about the tech technology and, and, and so on, but I wonder, I mean, you, I, I wonder about the different countries' agendas, and you're talking about, you know, how Argentina, for example, has a particular um, uh, interest um, and, and it's related to the tensions with, with the UK uh, and, and so forth. But what is, I mean, what are, there's cooperation and there's peace and, and there's the, the, those, those things, but what are Brazil's selfish interests and how does Brazil, if, if, if there are any, I'm assuming that there are, and how, do, how does Brazil leverage an organization like this, which is very loose and, 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 and not very, you know, able to do much, how does it leverage it to, for its own selfish interests and what are they? Yeah, that's that's really good question. I really, I think I just feel like this because you use the word organization. Ah, sorry. Yeah. Not I wasn't, I wasn't listening. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> um, but in terms of uh, how it advances its own agenda, I have found examples, for example, um, sorry, I have found examples in the Brazilian Foreign Ministry archives of showing, you know, Brazil, um, the Brazilian embassy uh, in Cameroon speaking back to Itamar Achi and be like, hey, Cameroon, can you vote for this, this, and this, and this? Mm -hmm. We'll support your interests in this, this, and this in the UN, for example. So there are some interests that are being furthered, not only for Brazil's cooperation within um, the South Atlantic. I mean, you think of um, the PSAL, you think of all sorts of, sorry, I'm using Portuguese terms, but non Portuguese. But um, but in terms of like other considerations with oil, with um, with the continental shelf, you know, Brazil wants to protect its environment, but it also is interested in collaborating and cooperating with the other countries. And as much as Argentina, you know, has these huge concerns, especially with the British presence in the South Atlantic, it's still in a position where it's still trying to, I think, especially in recent times, still trying to work out where it stands with that. Mm -hmm. um, I was actually talking to a colleague recently, you know, do you think the Falklands could ever be invaded again? It's like, well, no, I don't. Mm -hmm. uh, so in terms of um, Brazil's interests, they are multiple in the South Atlantic, not only for strengthening its cooperation with other member states, increasing the uh, reach of its navy, but also building its better relations with its extra regional powers, such as the US and you know, China's, you know, presence is growing as well about um, Argentina. So good. Okay. Um yeah. Okay then. So I guess my question um brings a little bit of you know the what you mentioned here about the lack of uh institutional framework and also the particular interests of um Brazil specifically with each country. And I was thinking more recently about the, for instance, the establishment of the open debates uh, and the US uh, influence in that whole process. So, 
because I was as a member of the conference, I also uh, recently exercised in this in this course is uh, sovereignty. How how is the country's position in terms of still nourishing these attacks as an environment for you know diplomacy and seeing to its interests and at the same time doing things that might generate reactions because it directly affects the level of militarization of the area. That's a very interesting question. I think I'll have to get back to you on that one, just because I think it requires more thought than I can just come up from at the moment. <laughs> so if that's okay, I'll definitely discuss that with you no, later. This is just something that came up as, you know, uh, I heard you speak to it. Yeah. Um, I mean, in terms of the maintenance of peace and the maintenance of the zone of peace, you know, Brazil is the leading player in, in this matters, but it, it's a zone of peace and cooperation. I think that needs to be remembered that as much as I talk a lot about zones of peace and I use theories of zones of peace, that element of cooperation is very important, especially when you look at the different agendas of um, the other member states. You know, you look at Angola, you know, Angola has all the issues that it faces in terms of protecting its interests in Africa, what with its own kind of oil, you've got Nigeria rising. So in terms of understanding the dichotomy between the different factors of um, the member states, you need to remember that as much as Brazil is seeking to position itself to a position of strength, and I guess in quite a realistic way, mm -hmm. it still is seeking cooperation. And this is where you know I spoke at length with Celso Morini about and Antonio Patriarca about the increase in presence of Brazilian embassies in Africa. You know, we can credit the PT government, the Brazilian government and the ruler for the amount of Brazilian embassies that sprang up in West Africa. You know, you think of the CPLP, you think of all sorts of other ways in which Brazil has sought to increase its cooperation with other countries, not only in Africa, but in other parts of the world. So I think as much as Brazil seeks to project itself as a rising power, as part of the BRICS, a part of IBSA, it still is a country that seeks to cooperate. Um, I know obviously we have Bolsonaro in power, so these things are all kind of, you know, the last kind of four years have been different. <laughs> but traditionally, Brazil is a country that has worked hard to, to maintain good and friendly relations with its neighbors, but also to promote, especially since Lula, um, good relations with can I just follow up? Do you think there has been uh, some sort of disengagement between these two groups? A disengagement yes. with Africa? From Brazil, uh, looking at their partners specifically. A disengagement? I think Brazil's been concerned with other things often enough, especially in the last uh, 10 years, especially with the Blue Amazon initiatives. Um, you know, it's had a lot of other concerns. But I, I do argue that have, there has been a revitalization. I think the fact that the Cape Verde meeting did not occur in 2015 was a blow to you know the revitalization steps. However, considering the resolution that came out last year saying you know Cape Verde was still very much on the table, that is something to be seen as a positive. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the new uh, Brazilian defense documents that came out in the last year and a half, the Zapatos is still there front and center as being part of the strategy for Brazil's interests in the South Atlantic. So it is still being talked about. But it's where this peaks of troughs, peaks and troughs, and Zopakis has very much kind of gone like this, like a swing. And I guess that's what's been the challenge, but also the rewarding experience of this PhD research is to see that there have been these oscillations between periods of great interest, not only on the part of Brazil, but of other member states, to have, you know, we saw in the 1990s the frequency of meetings every two years, you know, the immediate post Cold War period. But then also now, yes, there is this decrease. But when you think of the other initiatives that have come out of Brazil, but also of other countries, there have been a lot of things going on. I hope that answers your question. Okay. And uh, yeah. well, I think you talk about this considering some of the economic political prospects with 24 countries voting nearly in the government, including Brazil. There are 19. 21 foot tall pieces of metal. Two military units during the period. Part of the peace of Brazil, uh, again, deeply racist society. Over half the population of black, most of them are poor. 
Dominus, I would say 27 million people in the zone, but they were literally not just poverty, less than 44 years old. Degradation of the Amazon, killing of indigenous people, rampant corruption and nepotism, and I could go on. So, what does this whole any moral authority whatsoever to be disorganized in, which, as far as I'm concerned, is only a coalition of crews? Okay. Um, thank you for your question. Um, I also want to point out that the Parks is not an organisation, it's a zone of peace. Sorry to keep repeating that, but it's it's, it's very important to, to know the difference and also especially with the way in which it functions. You know, the Parks does not have um, the legal framework or the institutional framework to function like an organisation. I shall, I'm just trying to... Excuse me? I, I think as the, as the presenter, I have the right to prepare my answers the way I see fit. Thank you. Um, when it comes to um, the idea of Brazil having authority, well, considering it was an important uh, factor in the establishment of the, zone, of the zone and also the promotion of the ministerial meetings, I think when it comes to looking at the establishment and the progression and the evolution of the zone of peace, Brazil absolutely has a right to speak and it absolutely has a right to be present at the table because without Brazil, there wouldn't be a purpose. And without um, Brazil's you know, steps towards having these ministerial meetings and including the agendas for cooperation, for naval cooperation, for all sorts of other initiatives, you know, the, the zone of peace cooperation in the South Atlantic would not occur. So in terms of you know, your comments on Brazil's current government um, or on the other governments as well during this period, yeah, I think you know, they are very difficult countries to research and I'm sure anybody else who researches um, West Africa and South America, you know, there are many challenges to be faced. But in terms of the position of Brazil, I think unequivocally Brazil has the right to speak at that table, just as Argentina does, just as any of the other, you know, member states do. It's a zone of peace and cooperation. So in terms of Brazil having this leading role, it does, but it relies on the cooperation with the other member states. Hope that at least gives you. And it's and it's the biggest as well, it it, and it's and it's the biggest, right? Yes. So it gives it a profile. So uh, yes, there's one more there. Yes, hi, Linda. Um, my question would be more onto the zone of peace, and when you went through the research and obviously went through the zone of peace series, did you find any particular feature that would differentiate the books of archives with all the zones of peace that around the world, for example? Is there like an endemic feature properties of Argus? So when you can you consider, you know, you've got a zone that functions like a nuclear weapons free zone, none of the member states have nuclear weapons. You know, South Africa, as I said, only became a member once it disbanded the nuclear weapons program. You know, it's a zone that is exclusively made up of non-nuclear weapon states, and it's a maritime zone to be zone piece. If you look at the literature that looks, for example, at the Indian Ocean and the Indian the perceived zone of peace in the Indian Ocean, you know, you do have nuclear weapons in the States, you know, with India, with Pakistan, so the dynamics are very different. Um, so in terms of understanding the way in which the Zapakas function, because it doesn't have any sort of institutional framework, it doesn't have a budget, it doesn't have a Secretary General, it is essentially a declaration which has all these ministerial meetings and all sorts of other agendas. It is set up to be present in the South Atlantic, but also to stand as a, a, a kind of differentiating marker for the promotion of peace and cooperation in the way that that one of the Indian Ocean, for example, does not fit. Okay, um, then I think, unless there's somebody from online, um, let me take your raise as a hand or something, it might well be the time, and it is in fact the, the, the time to thank Marisa um, uh, properly, and we can do it uh, normally now, which is wonderful, so if you'd all join me in, in thank you again. <laughs> Everybody here, thanks to uh, everybody online, and thanks uh, to you, as I'm just going to stop recording. Yeah.